Thank you. What a joy and a privilege it is to stand before you. This room is filled with my heroes. That's right. Gideons are my heroes. Now, I know that for many, uh, athletes and actors and movie stars are their heroes. But for me, Gideons are my heroes. And let me tell you why. I'm sure most of you know exactly where you were on September 11th what we call 9-11 when the Twin Towers were attacked in New York City. I know exactly where I was. I was on my college campus. I had just graduated high school and began my college journey. And I remember standing there and watching the big screen as the towers were hit. And I remember it doing something to my heart. And I called my mom and I said, Mom, I'm going to sign up for the military and I'm going to go to war. And my mom said what every mom in this room would say. She said, no, you're not. I said, yes, I I have decided I'm going to uh, sign up for the Marine Corps. I'd never uh, thought which branch of service. I just knew that they were the first to fight, and I liked their uniforms. And so that's what I did. I signed up for the Marine Corps. I went down to Paris Island and very quickly was wondering what in the world did I get myself into. But after graduating boot camp and and getting in the Corps, I became a machine gunner in the Marine Corps, and I was put into a what they call a MAP platoon, a mobile assault platoon. What that simply means is that we didn't have a base. We were our own base. We were a mobile base, and so we could go anywhere and train to do anything which I was in the Marine Corps at a very dangerous time and served in a very dangerous place in Fallujah. You remember the fighting that was going on there. It was very dangerous at the time. It was so dangerous that where we were that many times they would just airdrop us our food. Uh, They couldn't bring it out because it was too dangerous for them to get to where we were. Matter of fact, I saw a chaplain one time who was brave enough to come where we were and his and his vehicle got hit by improvised explosive device and we never saw chaplains again. We were in a very dangerous place. But I'll never forget when I boarded the bus to head to uh, the, the transport for the plane that I was going to get on to go overseas to fight in Iraq. I'll never forget that as I boarded that bus, there was a man standing leaning up uh, on the bus with a cane and he was an older man and he was handing out testaments. Uh, he was handing out these little little Bibles. And, and I, I, I got one myself. And I thought, well, that's neat. That's pretty cool right there. I uh, love the size and love the color. It matched our uniforms. And I, I thought something very other was interesting. It fit perfectly right inside of my left breast pocket of my uniform. So I took that testament and I just placed it there in my left breast pocket as a good luck token and maybe that it would uh, bring me great success and bring me back home. And so I just placed it there, didn't think I would ever have a chance or an opportunity to read it. Well, as I told you, I was in a very dangerous place. They told us before we left that everyone wouldn't come home. And um, hearing those words, most people would not want to go if you knew that your chances of coming home were very slim. But I'll just be honest with you. I never thought it would be me. I never thought that I would get hurt. I never thought that I would get injured. I really thought that I would be just fine. But it did happen to me. In August of 2006, I was shot in the chest by a sniper. 7.62 armor round to the chest. If there's any military families or men in this room, you're thinking to yourself, you are a miracle. And ladies and gentlemen, I am a miracle. I'll never forget when I was shot in the chest and I was laying there in the sands of of Iraq. I remember all I could do was look up. And I begged God right there that he would spare my life. I didn't ask him to spare my life because I was afraid to die. I asked him to spare my life because I knew I wasn't ready to stand before God. I knew I needed to get some things in order. I knew I just wasn't ready. They were unable to get me air support to get me to any kind of medical care because of the sandstorms that were of that day. So they had to ground medevac me, which took a lot of time and and it was a long process to get me there. 
I'll never forget when they began to work on me when they finally got me to Fallujah Hospital. I remember that one of the officers said, this man's a miracle. Because I had, even though I had sustained the injuries to my chest, I had no internal bleeding. The Lord had certainly heard my prayer. I was there uh, in Fallujah Hospital. When you think about a, a hospital, you, you're thinking of a, a, a room with a TV and air condition. That's not the hospital that I was in. I was pretty much in a makeshift tent. Didn't have any visitors, didn't have no TV, didn't have no telephone. I was there all alone. And I'll never forget that one of my Marines, um, he came and visited me. Now you gotta understand something. We were a mobile assault platoon. We didn't go back to base. We didn't work from base. We were our own base. The only time we got to go to the base was if we got injured, we got killed, or our vehicles got hit by an explosive device and it needed to get repairs. One of my Marines, his vehicle got hit by a roadside bomb and he was coming back in to get vehicle repairs. Well, he knew that I was there and he would have a few days there. And, and, and so he was a good old country boy from Murfreesboro, Tennessee. And so he bought a good old watermelon off of a Iraqi and, and uh, he knew that he was going to see me and he wanted to put a smile on my face. And I don't know about you, if you're in any kind of hot weather, all it takes to put a smile on your face is a good old watermelon with a little bit of salt. Amen. All the country people in here know exactly what I'm talking about. And he did. He came walking in with that watermelon, grinning ear to ear. I'll never forget his words to me. He said, man, you are so lucky to be alive. And I said, you're right, buddy. I sure am. We had a good time. We ate that watermelon together. He walked out of that room, and that's the last time I was ever able to see him. One week later, he was shot by a sniper and killed instantly in Iraq. And I'll just be honest with you, my heart was broken. I I entered into the lowest point of my life. Again, I'm in a hospital room with no one to talk to, no one there, in isolation, injured. My fellow Marines are out fighting, getting hurt, injured, and dying, and I can do nothing about it. I was in the lowest point of my life. At that point, I had never experienced depression. But I had come to the lowest of lows where I didn't care if I lived or if I died. Not only was I in a pit of depression, I was in a pit of sin. My life was not being lived in the, in, in the way that it should have been lived. I was in a pit of depression and a pit of sin. And at that moment, I remember that little testament Bible that I had Only thing in my room was my my uniform sitting next to me. And I thought to myself, I wonder if that testament is there. And I reached over to where my uniform was and I reached into my left breast pocket and and there it was. I, I know many times people wonder why these little Gideon testaments have the Psalms and the Proverbs in it. It doesn't have all the Old Testament, it just has all the New Testament and the Psalms and Proverbs. Well, I'm here to tell you the reason why it's got Psalms in there is because of me. I opened that Bible and I began to read reading. I didn't have anything else to do. I was at the lowest point of my life and I, I came to the book of Psalms in chapter 40 and I, I read about a man named David who was in a pit of depression, in a pit that he couldn't get out of. He was not only in a pit of depression, but he was in a pit of sin. And I I started reading in Psalms chapter 40, verse 1 through 3, and he said, I waited patiently for the Lord, and He heard my cry, and He brought me up out of the pit, out of the miry clay, and He set my feet upon a rock, and He established my steps. He, He put a new song in my heart. Praise be to God. Many people will see it in fear and will trust in the Lord. And I just thought, Lord, if you can do that for David, surely you can do it for me. And right there in the room, Jesus changed my life forever. I'm sure that there's some Gideons and pastors in this room that maybe you're thinking, Lord, am I doing enough? Is, is, am I truly making a difference? Let me tell you something. I am living 
proof that old man who was standing next to that bus that day handing out those Bibles, he may have thought to himself, am I really making a difference? Yes, you are. I may never meet that man again this side of glory, but I can tell you something. The Testament changed my life. And I'm telling you, this world is in great need. I don't have to tell you that. This world is in trouble and it's in great need. We don't need another president. We don't need another politician. We don't need another person. All we need is the Word of God. That's what this world needs. So you need to keep on going on like you've never gone before. Give like you've never given. Serve like you've never served. Pray like you've never prayed. God is going to use you. Listen, the Marine Corps gave me a purple heart, but thanks be to God, He gave me a brand new heart. Thank you.